on the Jericho Road. <laughs> well, uh, about 20 minutes ago, I got notice that I needed to uh, introduce our speaker. So, uh, I do know his name. It's Mr. Bobby Hopper. Remember like the Dish Network, Hopper? That Hopper. Now, when, when, uh, when Jason told me he was coming, I, I knew that whoever came to speak would have to have a pretty good size set of shoes. <coughs> We, we got the shoes and we got other articles of clothing right along with that. Um, he, he's a great joy. The few minutes I've got to know him, great humor. He is our missionary, our Hale and Bethel Association Director of Missions. Now Bethel, we not, might not be familiar with him, but it's down in Marengo and Wilcox County in the Camden area. So he covers a lot of territory Hale County and Marengo County. And we're real glad to have him. Mr. Bobby has also been accused of being Junior Hill's son. So uh, he favors him a little bit in size and in facial features. So we, we love Mr. Junior Hill. Um, Brother Bobby, come on up and let the Lord lead you and whatever you need to say to us we'll be open and receptive to give him one hey this is way up here <laughs> <laughs> it is a joy to be with you this morning i hate to overdress jason i know yeah i hate dresses so i hate to overdress so. but I, i'm old school if i preach i'm at least going to be in a shirt time and I have people make fun of me all the time, and I just look at them and say, you wear what you want to wear? And they go, yes, and I wear what I want to wear. That's good. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, I've been the Director of Missions in Bethel for 14 years, and uh, I do cover from what is Miller's Ferry on the Alabama River to here. That's a long way to cover. But nonetheless, uh, when uh, the committee from the Health Association asked me would I come alongside and help last September, I agreed to, and here I am. I'm originally from Chilton County. I'm Jimison. I'm a Jimison Panther, and uh, there's two teams I don't pull for ever. That's Clear and Clanton. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I'm just, uh, I, I'm, uh, I have a doctorate, and people ask me, said, Hi, what's that DR stand for? I said, Documented Redneck. <laughs> I'm just a rural boy from rural Chilton County, from the hills and hollers of a little place called Mars Hill. Paul wasn't the only one at Mars Hill. I was there too. Different from Mars Hill, though. And uh, I'm actually from the little community of Posey's Crossroads in Bessie. Now, I know you don't know where any of that is, and thank God you don't. <laughs> but I'm glad to be with you this morning, and I uh, just want to share God's Word with you. Uh, before we get started, let me just tell you, uh, we just celebrated the 4th of July. And Independence Day, because the British celebrate the 4th of July. They just don't celebrate it like we do. But uh, I'm often reminded during the 4th of July, Memorial Day, and Veterans Day, of the high cost of freedom that was paid for me to be here today. Uh, the high cost, you won't believe, uh, because my dad fought in World War II under General Patton in North African Italy. My dad was wounded twice, and one time he was left for dead in a foxhole. And in that foxhole was two other soldiers. They were dead. And as the Germans were coming around with their bayonets to make sure they were dead, my dad heard them coming. He was shot just under the heart to the top of his right groin area. And uh, as he lay bleeding to death, he could hear the Germans, you know, killing the other GIs and hear the moans and groans. And when they got to the foxhole where dad was, dad took both of the dead soldiers in the foxhole with him and pulled them together over him. And he could feel the bayonets piercing one heart and piercing the other heart. And they said, what about the guy in the bottom? And they said, or the guy in the middle. And they said, oh, he's dead too, and left. I'm here today because two men sacrificed their lives in the foxhole of my dad and my dad and my Leo. And I told that story one time, and they said, you, you're alive today because of the man in the middle lives. That's true, and you are too. 
If you're a Christian here today, you're alive today because the man in the middle lives. And so we, we don't need to take our freedom lightly. I don't know who those two men were. Don't know who their families are. But I'm here today because they paid the ultimate sacrifice for my freedom and your freedom. When I turned 18 years old, my dad took me to the courthouse in Clanton. And we don't, I'm from Jimison, we don't call it Clanton, it's Clanton. They leave out the tea. So that's how you know somebody's Chilton County. Only the folks in Clanton call it Clanton. I pastored there for five years and tried to win them to the Lord. You know how that is, you know. <laughs> Remember, I don't like Clanton and Clear. <laughs> and I worked at Calera most of my life at a cement plant, so I'm an old worker. I, I have the joy of being able to have made a living working with my hands in a cement plant, building houses, and everything else. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about Bobby. I'm here to talk about God and Jesus and the wonderful Christian life you can live. When you came to church this morning, what was your expectations when you got here? Get loud, man. Now, a lot of people come, you know, I've had several times, they said, we're going to be down today. Well, listen, you got to Bob on the when you got me, so I mean, what do you expect? But I, I, I've been preaching now 30 something years. I remember sitting around and looking at these old guys that had 30 years of experience under development. I go, wow, how's it going to be? I don't know if I can be in the ministry in 30 years. And I looked at the calendar one day, I looked at the uh, uh, plaques on the wall, and talked about me being a, a director of missions and being a deacon. I am an ordained deacon in my home church. I always be a deacon, they tell me. And so I went to Jimmons High School, graduated the University of Alabama, went on to New Orleans Seminary and got my doctorate from Beeson. My father-in-law one time asked me, he says, uh, why do you go to school all the time? I said, I started out a pretty smart boy. <laughs> but the more I went to school, the dumber I got. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, I don't know anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So what did you come expecting today? Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Habakkuk. Chapter 5. Now, don't be embarrassed if you don't know how to get to Habakkuk. Uh, just go to your index and the concordance or whatever and look up Habakkuk and go to it. <laughs> it's okay. Do that. I'm an English minor and history major, and I can't spell and I can't pronounce words. I learned how to spell by memory. I still don't spell arithmetic, and y'all gonna laugh, so we can do this. I spell arithmetic. A red Indian thought he might eat turkey in church. <laughs> Geography. George E. Old Gray Bad at Paul's house yesterday. I spell by memory, not by phonics. I've learned phonics through the years, so sometimes we read these scriptures that the words we can't pronounce, I can't pronounce them. But I want to read the first five verses of this book of Habakkuk, chapter one. The setting is, is evils everywhere. They're using, God's using the child ends to punish his people when they don't do right. And this is a question Habakkuk has to God and God answers. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Oh Lord, how long shall I and you will not hear? Or cry and you will not hear. How long shall I cry and you won't hear God? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's a strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore the perverse judgment proceeds. The Lord's reply is, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will show you a work in your days which you would not believe, though I told it you. I'm going to show you a work that you may not believe. There, there's three things that come to me in this scripture. You know, I always got three points in a poem. I don't know a poem this morning, but, you know. but the three points. One of the things is evil is always a clear and present danger to <clears> us. <throat> always. You know, we pray for peace, peace. No, can I tell you, there'll never be any peace in the world. Even when Jesus came as a babe and He said, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We read it wrong. It says there'll be peace among men of goodwill. It didn't say there'd be peace around the world. It said there'd be peace among men of goodwill. We'll never have world peace. 
Well, never have world peace because Satan and his imps and all the demons that's out there haven't been cast into the lake of fire yet. They're still very present. You know, as a pastor, I looked around, someone asked me, I want to go about the gray hair. This is platinum. <laughs> I wasn't, I was When I first went to Platinum and finished back to church, I had just a few gray hairs. Five years later, why? God miraculously moved in that church when every time God moved, Satan did too. Constantly, constantly, constantly. If you're not coming out of trouble, you're about to go into it. You know, you might be there. Either you're in it, coming out of it, going into it. It's always there. It's always a clear and present nature. Down in one of my churches in the Bethel Association is Catherine. Catherine, they have more Presbyterians there than do Baptists. They only meet twice a week, I mean twice a month. And as they meet, the, 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 the Presbyterians, they only meet once a year, so they, they meet together. And so together they don't have about 15 to 20 members. Small church, small church. But there's a man at church by the name of Joe Harrison. Joe Harrison's dad run the Chivalry Place in Thomasville. And Joe told me an interesting story that made me think when I read this. Joe said that he, he's a big game hunter. His house is so full of trophies that he had to take his carport and make it to the dining room because everything else was full of trophies. He's got the only Siberian bear in the United States. He killed it in Siberia. He's got this, he just got this massive room full of trophies. And, and I look at him, <coughs> there's a bearskin rug in the floor, and then there's all these other exotic animals. And in the floor is this lion. He's huge. I mean, it, my hand stretched out is like his paw closed up. Humongous animal. You know, I've seen him in the zoo. I've seen him like that there. But to get this close and touch it, his head is massive. It's a massive body of a creature, of a beast. And we know that the, the lion is the king of the jungle. And I can see why I'm beside this lion. He said, let me tell you about me shooting this lion. And I said, sure. He said, I was in Africa, of course. And he said, we had this guy that was guiding us. and said, we were hunting lions. Now, that's pretty dumb, isn't it? Go hunt something that's going to hunt you. So he's hunting this lion, and, and they're walking, and there's a thicket, and the guide says, do you see? Joe says, see what? He says, the lion. He's looking at us. He said, what? He said, he's looking at us. He says, I don't see him, but he said, he sees you. He said, he's 15 steps right in front of me. He said, I don't see him. He said, he sees us. We're his lunch. And Joe says, all of a sudden, he saw a set of eyes. It's kind of like all the fans have got the set of eyes. He said, saw his eyes. And the guy says, can you make the shot? He says, I think I can. He says, they don't think you can. Either you can or you can't. Because if you can't make the shot, He's going to get us. He's going to be on us before we can kill him. And he says, I think you can. He said, I'm telling you, Mr. Joe, you've got to make sure that you can shoot the lion. He said, I can do it. It's obvious he did because he had a little place up above his eyes where he shot it, but it was in his room, you know. Here's the thing. They were hunting a lion, but the lion found them. The guide in the story is like the Holy Spirit with us. Evil is constantly out there. And the Holy Spirit is saying, Bobby, Billy, Joe, Sue, can you do this? If you can't, i got to do it. Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians that the Lord will never put more on us than we can handle, and if He does, He'll give us a way out to handle it. But I just want you to notice in this, here's this people the nation of Israel, that God is using an evil people to judge them. God does that. God uses evil things to judge you and to judge me. We, we, I love the rain. People hate rain because it's much of it. Trust me, I'd rather have too much rain than watch it dry up. Growing up, we watched our garden dry up many times. 
standing alone from soil there in Chilton County. But but Habakkuk says there's idolatry, there's falsehood, there's oppression, there's three thievery, and there's injustice. Does that sound familiar? We as God's people have got to start doing a better job of facing the future. All these things that's happening to us is the Bible unfolding and God's coming again. Did y'all realize that Jesus is coming again? This world's not going to get better. It's kind of like a deacon in my home church said one time. The world is like a road to the river. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. It's downhill the whole way. Now, I'm not here to preach doom, despair, and agony on me, but I'm here to tell you God said it was going to happen, and you and I know it's going to happen. And we need to be telling folks, whether it's in Toronto, Canada, or in Malville, or down way down in Catherine, Alabama, that there's a Savior that can help you in this time of need. I've never seen society like it is. There's things, I tell folks now, I tell this all the time. My dad was a lost man. He was 58 years of age. He was like a lot of GIs. He said he couldn't be saved for all the people he killed and all the things he'd done and all the stuff that was out there. And I said, God's still working. And he said, How do you know? I said, I'm still praying for you. In 58 days, he was saved. He lived two years before he died. But here's the deal evil is always out there working to get us and trapped us. And Jesus said, I'm coming to take my people home. And our confidence is that, you know, we look at this and say, all this evil is happening. And I, and I, tell, I tell people this. My dad as a lost man 30 years ago had more Christian morals than a lot of Christians have today. You hear what I said? My daddy as a lost man had more Christian values than a lot of Christians do today because his mother taught him Christian principles. When the GIs showed up at the doorstep there in Lawley, Alabama, and to tell her that my daddy was dead, she said, he's not dead. Yes, ma'am, he is. No, he's not. He's not dead because I'm still praying for him. He was captured one time, too, for three months. We escaped and we hid out for three months. But here's the deal. Evil is always out there. Wickedness breeds more wickedness. Every day we see evil getting a little bit more whole, a little bit more whole, a little bit more whole. But you and I have the key. If we know Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, we have the key to true freedom. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. <coughs> Not in 1776 or in the future. But back at Calvary, He paid the price for our salvation. <coughs> but see, we have warning signs all the time. I pastor there in Clinton, as I said, and they took out the Black Snake Road Bridge. Had signs up on each end coming into the area. Warning, bridge out. Warning, bridge out. And every day in my office, I hear people backing up. They went down there and tried to cross the bridge. It wasn't there. God has given us warning signs every day. He's reminding us every day He's coming again. He's reminding us every day we need a Savior. See, when we get to the end of ourselves, we see the beginning of Him. When we realize we can't do it, we let Him handle it when we should let Him handle it to start with. And so, this evil is always present. The second thing is, is ministry is about God. Not Mount Baptist Church. Not Hale Baptist Association. Not the United States of America. Not the White House. Not what's happening overseas. Ministry is about God. God is the center of the universe. Not me, not you. So many times we think it's all about us and what we can do. I tell people all the time, there's the church. And Mount was part of the church along with community and Concord and Mount uh, Hebron and so forth and so on. We're part of a large group of people that are called Christians. The church. And so we work together. Max Lucado says, perhaps our place is not in the center of the universe, God does not exist to make a big deal of us. We exist to make a big deal out of Him. It's not about you. It's all about Him. This morning, we should have come to the expectation here this morning. Yeah, we're low in attendance, but God has a message for us today. Whether it's in Sunday school, maybe in a little devotion we read this morning. God has a message for us. And there ought to be some anticipation that something wonderful is going to happen. Something wonderful. I, I was preaching. Again, had a lot of things happening for him. 
preaching one Sunday, and from the pulpit to the back of the church, or front, or what you call that back under, I apologize to God. I prayed, I studied, and I just, I, I bombed. It's horrible. God, I'm sorry. People coming out and they're telling me, you know, people lie at church every Sunday. That's a good sermon. That's a good sermon. That's a good sermon. <laughs> so they're, they're filing out, and this lady stops and she says, Thank you for your message this morning. Thank you so much. I've been praying over a situation, and God gave me the answer in your sermon this morning. I was taken back. I said, well, are you new to the community? Are you visiting? Are you looking for a church? Uh, you know, who are you? And she said, oh, no, we're on vacation from Florida, and we stayed at Shoney's Inn last night, and we was eating breakfast at the breakfast bar this morning, and we was trying to go to church somewhere, and we didn't want to go right there on the interstate, and they said, try friendship. And my church members just had to work that day. And she did. From the back of the church to the pulpit, I apologize to God for no one morning. See, so it wasn't about me that morning. It's about what the Word of God had to say to a person. One person in that church that needed that answer to that prayer. You may be here this morning and don't get a thing out of the message. But guess what? It fell on somebody's ear that needed to hear it. They may be struggling. You may be struggling with a marriage. You may be struggling with finances. You may be struggling with whatever. But just let me encourage you, expect great things from God. See, we get caught up in our own world and we begin to question God. Why God? Why me? Why me? My mama was dying of cancer. She died two years, three years after dad did. Both of them died from smoking. Mom's all eat up with melanoma stage four. When the undertakers picked her up, she was like a rotten stick that was falling all to pieces. 55 years old. Just a kid. I'm 65. I can say that. She's laying on the hospital bed, her arms already in two on the right side. She can't hardly get it to make it. Nobody's told her she doesn't have the days. I'll help her. Don't lie to me, I know when you lie, I have to have a look at your eyes. How long I got? I said, well, Mommy, you know, when you had your spell back in October, they said you had six months to a year. You know, when you had the other spell in November, they said you had three to six months. You know, when we went to the hospital this other day, the, the doctor, they said you got days. She died about 30 days later. She lays back in the hospital bed. She says, why us? Big C is the word we fear. Cancer. And I said, why not us? I said, Mama. I called her Mama, not Mother. I called her Mama. Mama, if you could give your cancer to somebody, who would you give it to? And this is what she said. I wouldn't curse anybody with this disease. I said, that's why you have it. That's why you have it. God knows you can handle it. I pray that when I come to the end of my life, I could be as brave as mom and dad was when I died. But here's the thing. We get caught up about us, and we forget it's about God, and God is using us. He may be using you in a divorce and through a divorce. He may be using you in a sickness. He may be using you in whatever. Just you being here this morning is an inspiration to somebody else in this building. We need to come expecting God's going to do something. God's going to do something because He's a great God. So many times we get caught up in all these emotions. Let me tell you, it was the premier episode of CSI Miami on CSI. Thursday night. I had been to the Democritus Academy baseball championship game. They would win the championship the next day, by the way. It was the night before the big game, final game. And there's a knock on the door. And there's a telephone call. They can't find Johnny Randall. Johnny Randall had gotten on work that day to do some, to go to his son, uh, Pete uh, Byron's. Uh, honors Day, Green Hill Hospital. I was Pastor Gay. Pastor there three years. They can't find him. They think he's in a ditch somewhere on the cherry farm. Bruce and Sandy Cherry Farm. Because after the war today, he went to cut hay. And then now he's going to coach his daughter, Anna Ruth, in the softball. 
But when he didn't show up to the game, he said something wrong. And his son jumped in and said he's probably ditch dead somewhere. He actually was. He was bush hogging in a ditch instead of being V-shaped, was had an overhang. And he went across it, and went back across it, the trash turned upside down, and it hit him, crushed him, and then back back over him. He was like he was sitting on it. He said, we can't find him. We can't find him. It's 7 o'clock at night, we was all looking, they found him. His family thought he was going to come up out of the ditch. He's been dead, the undertaker said, since about one. I go from a baseball championship to a, somebody accidentally get killed. It's hard to tell a little girl and her two, three brothers and their mama and their grandparents and their two uncles that daddy's dead. I go, God, what did I do? How, how, did, how did I handle this, God? So I take a deep breath and I gather them all up. I says, this afternoon, whatever time it was, God needed Johnny in heaven and he knew that y'all were going to be hurting today, tonight. And I said, let me tell you this, though. When Johnny entered the gates of heaven, every house that's done, and I don't know all about how it's working right now, I do know to be, you know, to live is to, 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 is to, to live, but to die is gain. If you're dead, you're in the presence of God. And this afternoon, Johnny was in the presence of God. He said, Johnny, turn around here. I'm going to show you why I did this. I'm going to show you why. And I said, Johnny's a picture of it. You and I got to deal with it. Well, the next day was a championship. I didn't get to go to it. I had to go make funeral arrangements. That night was wedding rehearsal. The next day, my daughter graduated the University of Mount Alabama. That night, I had to wait. That afternoon, I had to wait. And then I went to be with the family. And the day that my daughter graduated, that, that afternoon was the wedding. I went to that, went to the home. The next day was Mother's Day, dedicated about eight babies. I had the sermon, and at two o'clock did Johnny's funeral. Why don't you look at the range of emotions? Winning championships, somebody getting killed. Waiting, somebody getting married, somebody graduating college. Baby dedication. I look back, it wasn't nothing Bobby did. It's what God did. It's what God did. And that's what that ministry's about God, not about you, not about me. See, God is implementing what He wants done through you and through me. He doesn't have to, but He does. Not only that, God is never too early. He's never too late. He's always on time. You and I might be late. We might be early. What happens to us? A preacher friend of mine, he's dead now. He says, Bobby, I haven't got to talk to you since you went into the ministry, but let me give you one bit of fatherly advice as one of your dads in the ministry. And I said, what is it, Brother David? He said, churches are going to ask you to pray about something or do something make a decision. He said, you tell them you're going to pray about it. And he genuinely pray about it. And he said, when you pray about it, you turn it over to God. And no matter how much the church presses you, the deacons press you, or that person presses you, you tell them you turn it over to God and you're praying and wait on God. What gets us as preachers in trouble, we run ahead of God or lay behind. He says, wait on God. I'll try to do that in the whole ministry. Well, our third thing in this is here's a backup. He, God, there's all this violence. There's all these things happening. There's all about this, all this stuff happening. And then he says, Habakkuk, if I told you what I was going to do with this child then, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. See, we don't believe God. God says, I am coming again. And until I do, lo, I'm with you even until the end of the age. And we know by history that the Chaldeans come in, but they took over the people. And punished the, the Hebrew kids. And he got right with God for a while. And he got back to bed again. And he somebody else come in. Somebody else come in. Somebody else come in. Somebody else come in. Can I tell you a little secret? The world ain't getting no better. The evil ain't getting no lighter. But let me tell you, the darker it gets, 
the brighter the light, you are the light, you are the salt. The last thing is, is God is doing some amazing things. I was on a building trip with the Bethel Baptist Builders who got people on the team from Kentucky and Texas and Arkansas and Louisiana. We, we just got Bethel. One of the things I try to tell the guys in the Hell Association, Bethel's more than this Bethel Association. It's, it's bigger than that. And we had some people from Gay and Church who went with us. So it's, you know, it's, it's a hell thing to We was on a building trip. I've watched God. I'm a director of missions today because of a building trip to Old Missouri in 1982. Eighty-two. I went from being a uh, just a, a, a laborer at a cement plant to pastor to here. And all because of God, not because of me. I'm nothing but one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. But God did some amazing things on the building trip just a couple weeks ago. He took some great things to Jason and them up in Toronto, where they are right now. Amazing. And God does amazing things right here in the Bible. You just think about the tragedies and stuff you get through in the last few months. God is doing an amazing work. Here's the trouble, though. When my son, baby son, who's now 30 and lives in Texas, was uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, something like that, he was my associate pastor for years. From seven years old, so he could live and went to Texas. He was my sidekick, you might say. One morning, I took him to the McDonald's gym in Jemison, Alabama. Now, we, we don't have much in Jemison. We've got two red lights now that means everything. And we, got a, we do have a McDonald's now. I don't know why they call it fast food. <laughs> Sometimes they get stuff in a restaurant quicker than I do with McDonald's. Every morning we stop in at McDonald's. Every morning. We stop in, it's a Friday morning. And we done decided what we want. We go in and I place the order. And the lady said, well, we, when we pulled up, we noticed there was cars from the drive-up window all the way around McDonald's, all the way back around in the front, all the way down in the Highway 31. And tra traffic trying to get off 31 in McDonald's. Odd. So we place our order. We go in, place our order, and I'm going to get a biscuit for her, and I'm going to get uh, a biscuit also. And she said, I'm sorry, we don't have any biscuits. You don't tell a fat boy on a Friday morning at 7 o'clock we have no biscuits. <laughs> and I was a lot heavier than now, too. I said, okay, I'll have a, I have pancakes and sausage, and what do you want, son? Breakfast burrito. Okay, we got to have that. Well, you know, you know these restaurants. You probably got them here in Manville, where all the old men go and solve the world's problems. Y'all have that here in Manville? What? what is, what's it? What is it here? What now? Okay. Well. I'm sitting there with my son, and it's wonderful. I, in fact, I wrote a poem. I, I should have brought it and shared it with you for him. About these old guys sitting around talking in retrospect, you know. Now he is one. But anyway, <laughs> I, was, I was listening to him, and, and I said, I can't believe they're out of biscuits this morning. One old guy said, huh, they ain't just ate out of biscuits. They're out of stuff to make the biscuits. I'm not going to say what? <laughs> huh? So, you know. Bobby's got an inquisitive mind. I want to know why. <laughs> so I go back to get my decaf coffee refill. I go back up there to the front end. And I said, uh, they, the old guys around there tell me that, that, that you don't even have the stuff to make the biscuits this morning. She said, we sure don't. And I said, it's Friday morning, 7 o'clock. And you're already out of biscuits? She said, well, we just didn't, we didn't order them. And I said, there's a hoggly woggly. Now, that's what y'all call a piggly wiggly. But we had a hoggly woggly just across the parking lot. I said, they got Pillsbury pop up biscuits over there. You could have got that. They're not one of our vendors. I go, okay. And I said, how did this happen? Well, there's a lady from the Jemison High School that comes in here every Friday and buys 100 biscuits. And I said, man. 
She said, we didn't bring around our biscuits. I said, how often does she buy them? Every Friday. I said, manager can't plan for that. We don't know if she's going to buy them or not. I said, how often does she buy them? Every Friday. <laughs> I mean, I'm a simple-minded guy. If you buy them every Friday, I finally told her, I said, lady, what you need to do is, is you need to get a contract with her. And what this lady was doing, she's buying them, carrying them to Jim's school, so. You know, I said, you just need to get a contract with her. And I go back, and I just, I can't believe they're out of biscuits. I just can't believe they're out of biscuits. Now, I'm telling you, and their biscuits weren't near as good as Mama's, but, you know, they are good biscuits. Well, I drop her in off the school, and you're going to say, where in the world is he going with this story? Well, I'm in the car and I'm headed to Clanton. Again, Clanton had more things happen. I'm not saying that in the I've had four churches, just that had a lot of good, great things happen to it. They make the story sound good. By the way, I'm a I'm an inductive pastor, preacher, not a deductive. Most people get stuff out of the scripture. I take a story and go back to it. Well, I'm riding down the road. Has God ever slapped you? I'm serious. Has God ever just slapped you upside the head? I'm riding down the road and all of a sudden God slapped me like one of the Michael Bell commercials. You don't know, you know, people know what that is, shaving and most of the stuff. But anyway, God goes, and he goes, Bobby, you're thinking about biscuits. You're thinking about biscuits. How many people show up at the Friendship Baptist Church on Sunday morning eating with spiritual biscuits? Mmm. How many people show up at Mount Baptist Church and there's no spiritual biscuits? Sunday school starts at 9.45, not 10, not 10.15, not 10.30, 9.45. So that means you need to be here at 9.15 or 9.30 because there's students coming need to be here. That's one of the things all the time. Also, if you're not going to teach Sunday, you need to tell somebody before this few minutes they got to do something. Ain't that right, Brother you got to, you know, it's all these things. You know, the music this morning was wonderful with the pants and, and, the, and the special that we had. I go to some of our churches and say, I ain't got that picked out today. Anybody want to sing something? <laughs> yeah, I'll sing. And they sing way off key. <laughs> kind of does something to the worship service when you're not prepared for it, when you've run out of the stuff to make worship. Can I tell you, worship takes a lot of prayer, a lot of study, a lot of involvement. Don't run out of spiritual biscuits on Sunday morning. Be fluid. No, flexible is too stiff. We've learned this in disaster relief. Be flexible. Be fluid. That's even more than flexible. Why? Because God said, I'm going to do some great things and if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't believe it. What are you just talking? God's going to do some unbelievable things in this church, and you need to be ready to go. People say, What's your success as a director of missions? They tell me I'm one of the best in the state, and I go, Boy, we're in trouble. I'm like old Avery with experiencing God. I'm trying to find out what God's doing and say, God, can I go with you? Can I be part of that God? That's what he says. He says, Abaka, be aware. Stay in the maze of what I'm about to do, because I'm about to do something great. He says, it's going to be so unusual that if I told you, you'd say, you're crazy. In fact, if somebody had told me back in 1981, that I'd be at the Mount of Baptist Church as a director mission for two associations and 48 churches preaching the gospel message this morning. I just said, you've got to be kidding me. You're crazy. You've got to be kidding me. But you know what? If you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and say, God, here I am. I'll do it. It's amazing what you can do. We were writing papers in seminary, and I'm a horrible speller. They said, we're going to study the exit of Jesus, and I go, how do you spell that? And they looked at me kind of funny. I'm an English minor, and they said, how do you spell that? 
And they look at me, go, oh, really, how do you spell it? They just laugh at me and go, X A Jesus. It's not how you spell it, but I need more touch. And hermeneutics was a trip trying to spell hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. And here's what they would say. We get our papers back, and I'd have a hundred plus bonus points. And they'd go, how can you write a paper and can't spell? This is spell check, y'all. This is for the people had it. And i go, very limited vocabulary. <laughs> and when I found the thesaurus, I said, praise God. I didn't know something like that existed. But you know what? I make my living minded. If you read the back of the Alabama Baptist, for the Hell Association. I like those articles. They're not written like I talk. If I talk Chiltonian, but I write American Standard English to write you. Why? Because God took a poor old boy from Chilton County who was willing to be used, and here I am today. Am I there yet? No way. But I'm trying to get there. We're going to have an annual invitation tonight. And God is telling you, he said, listen, listen, times are going to get tough. If I told you what I was doing in your life, it probably would scare you to death. But you can rest assured I'm working in your life for your good and your better. Let me pray for this, Mr. Trump. Father, I thank you for this day that we've had together. Just this moment in time, this divine appointment that you had in your heart and your mind way before the day. Father, I don't know who needed this message this morning, but Father, I pray you speak to their heart right now. And whatever they need to do, whether it's public, private, whatever commitment they need to make, I pray they make it. That Father, not only to bless them, but to bless people around them. People that are saved and those that are lost that need to know Jesus Christ. Well, we know that we, we, we all agree today that we all fall short. We all sin. It's the it's lost world that don't understand that. But we understand we need to be here today because we all fall short. And we're here today to lift one another up. Again, thank you for what you're going to do at this time. Thank you for Jason and the team being away. Ministry. I pray great things will be done. And when they come back, they'll bring some exciting news back. And they'll receive some from what's happened here. I just ask that the name belong. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.